off unless you want me to sing out loud. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now, I'm losing bad. Stood on this stage night after night, reminding the broken it'll be all right. But right now, oh, right now, I just can't. It's easy to sing when there's nothing to bring. They say it only takes a little faith to move a mountain. Well, good thing, a little faith is all I have right now. God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, oh, give me the strength. Amen, amen. Welcome, welcome at home, welcome here. Wonderful song, I, I, I love that. It, it, it really is an emotional song when you think about those that are hurting without hope, without hope in Christ. I know us, you know, we will stand firm, but man, sometimes your back has to be against the wall to truly cling to Christ. And that's sad that we wait until our back is against the wall to do that. Um, but man, even if, even if, and, and it fits so, so key to our message tonight uh, as we look at the, uh, 
the an event in a person's life and and man what a powerful what a powerful message uh, proclaimed through it but um, let me pray before we get started and then we'll we'll dive in Lord God we come to you and we just uh, we just thank you we thank you for the hope that we have the security that we have but more than just security dear Lord the the love that has been poured out upon us dear Lord the the peace that transcends all understanding of, of, of the chaos in which the world in which we live. Dear Lord, moment by moment, such uncertainty, but dear Lord, you are a certain God. And you make the uncertainty certain. You make the unstable stable. Dear Lord, may we cling to you in good times and bad because you create them both. You're the God of the good and you're the God of the bad. All right? You're in it all. And you're using it for your purpose. May we look beyond our circumstance and our situation and see what you are doing behind the scenes. And when we can't see, let us just trust. Let us just trust and know without a shadow of a doubt, dear Lord, that you've got good in store for what we walk through every door, every step. Dear Lord, as I know many are, are amidst uncertain times and uncertainties, dear Lord, let, not, let us not go into it hopeless but with hope, with hope and cling to Christ. Dear Lord, bless our message tonight. May you prepare hearts, eyes, and ears to hear and see and receive exactly what you have in store. Lord God, nothing of me cleanse me of all of my agenda and my opinions because they mean absolutely nothing outside of the cross. And I just pray, I just pray that you would allow this message to land upon hearts exactly of where they need it to hit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Well, tonight, uh, the title we are going to be focusing on, Trusting in Christ in Life and Death. Trusting in Christ in Life and Death. And we're going to be skipping around a little bit uh, in one main section, Acts 6, going through Acts 8. We are not going to read Acts 6, 7, and 8, but we are going to hit a lot of the high points and specific uh, aspects of that, talking about a man named Stephen. Uh, but before we dive in uh, straight to the, to the points and the, the meat of the message, I want to I talk about a topic that our world, it, it's, uh, you know, I don't know how you feel, but a lot of our world is consumed with superheroes superheroes a big thing you know maybe not as much now as it was years ago uh, I know growing up it was a big thing but um, looking at at movie superheroes comic superheroes depending on the way you look at it if you look at your book on page 66 it gives you a little breakdown it talks more about Star Wars and things like that I wasn't big into Star Wars you know I love spider-man Superman I did enjoy uh, those as superheroes but it, it, it gives you great statistics here that roughly uh, so, many, so many millions of people that invest time into superhero type memorabilia, superhero type movies and the, and the things that just consume. We are kind of consumed with that superhero aspect uh, to a certain point. Um, it just seems that we love the good story that is kind of out of the, the, the norm or um, how, could, how do you say it, uh, not natural maybe, you know, over worldly, not worldly powers, but miraculous type powers that people have that humans don't possess. Um, you know, we're kind of taken back by that. Um, but man, it, we as Christians, you know, even when I talk like that, and even when I say, you know, powers of just kind of miraculous powers, being able to fly, being able to lift anything, you know, when you think about the different superheroes, um, man, we think about the superhero that we have, that we know of, and think about those same terms, you know, extraordinary power, you know, or super, super strong vision to see through things. Is that not what Jesus is? You know, does he not have super miraculous powers? Does he not see through things? You know, when you compare the superhero of that we see in the movies and, and on billboards or comics compared to the one we see in the gospel, because the gospel is the story of our superhero, Jesus. 
you know, but he wasn't a superhero that wore tights or a cape or flew around. It's not, it's not the superhero that he was. And we know as we look through Scripture that uh, he was anything but that. But man, he was the creator of the universe. He did, you know, he came, he defeated our enemies. Yes, it wasn't the uh, Green Goblin and, you know, I don't even remember some of the other ones that are out there, but he didn't come to defeat them, but he did come to defeat Satan, sin, and death. Enemies that would make the greatest comic book villains, they quake in their boots, the author says, at the name of Jesus. So, with that being said, I threw the first question up there, and I even tried to, uh, I was going to break out in cape, but uh, just, just, to, just to tell who our superhero was, I uh, found this, found this shirt. Uh, I felt like if I tore my shirt and did all that, that it may get, uh, you know, you may not think what I was doing. But when we think about who our superhero is, it's Jesus. You know, it's Jesus. Jesus is our superhero. He does all those things. Yes, maybe not with his finger and with this, but man, what miraculous things that bring us such joy and peace. You know, yes, you might watch a, someone fly across the thing and, and save someone, but man, how many people have we watched Jesus save? And he didn't have to fly across nothing. I mean, just think about your superhero aspects and then think about what Christ has done. Um, so, first one, how might superheroes, how might the superheroes in your life affect the way that you esteem or perceive Jesus? <clears throat> how might you, you look at Jesus compared to superheroes maybe in your life? There's some different ways that we can look at this question because me and Amanda, when we, you know, a few days ago when we asked this, she's like, man, I struggled with this question. Struggled with what it was really wanting to ask. But when you think of how you would perceive your superheroes, now our superheroes could be everything, and I hope Jesus has caused you to maybe redefine your superheroes. Maybe the superheroes you had as a teenager or even a young adult or maybe you had at some point in your life have changed because of Jesus. And the way that you view him in your life, you see people as heroes that maybe you didn't see as heroes. You know, and that was kind of the way the Lord took me when I began to just think about this question was, my superheroes have changed to the point of maybe wanting to be the all-star on the football team and looking up to someone because of their outside athletic ability and saying, man, I want to be like that, man, that's my hero. Or an athlete in the NFL or the the, the NBA or something like that, man, yeah, man, that's, that's my hero. To the point of other people that have done miraculous things for me in my life to be there for me in some of my hardest times, to lift up prayers for me that I watch play out in my life. Um, ones that stand there for you and by you and ones that you can depend on. So, you know, Hopefully, Jesus has even transformed the way in which you see superheroes. But that's exactly what we're going to talk about. We are going to look tonight at a man's life, and, and one that is going to challenge us, I believe, to the core. Um, and we're going to see how, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we can stand up to any situation, whether it be life or death, trusting Christ with no doubt and no, no withdrawals. So with that being said, we are going to be in Acts 6, starting out, point number one, God's people speak boldly, empowered by the Holy Spirit's presence. God's Spirit, or God's people speak boldly, empowered by the Holy Spirit's presence. Somebody want to read those three verses? If they if they get up, are we? Hey, we got we got a new guy back here working the system. Awesome. 
Awesome. Good. Great job with those words, too. Yeah, I knew they were going to come into play there. <laughs> so we want to look at Stephen here. All right, and, and there's, there's a lot leading up to this. If you go back and read uh, in the very beginning of Acts, just to set up a little scenario of Stephen and how it come about, uh, the church was growing in Acts, as we, as we have talked about the early church, and, and it was growing as, as Peter and John, we talked about last week, um, with things that they were doing and, and miracles that they were performing through the power of the Holy Spirit and how people were hearing the gospel, believing and coming to Christ, and it was just flourishing. Well, what was happening was a lot of those that were preaching the gospel were having to take care of other roles. They were having to serve, and in this case specifically was talking in regards to widows, taking care of widows. Those that were proclaiming the gospel and going out were having to perform too many tasks, and they were just short, a lot like the church is today of the harvest is plenty, but their laborers were few. So they decided to choose seven people. Seven, and this is actually, it's, it's really, I love the, how it relates to where we're at. There were seven deacons that they chose. Stephen was one of these deacons that they chose. But if you go back and read in the first, they chose seven of them in order to perform these tasks. And their role was to serve, to serve. But you're going to see in this, and I love this aspect that Stephen as a deacon did far more sometimes than what we think uh, is, is our role or what it's called. But Stephen was. He was one of the chosen seven, uh, chosen as, as a deacon to take care of widows, but way more did he do in his role. But um, what has happened now is Stephen began to perform tasks, began to share about Christ, began to do his ministry that he had been called to, opposition arises. And that's kind of what we see here. And I really want to give a little feedback on this Freedman Synagogue. For some reason, that just jumped out at me. You know, the people that opposed him were from this organization. And I'm going to just share just a little bit as I researched and looked up a little commentary on this. But the Freedman Synagogue is only mentioned once here in the Bible. It's the only place that they are mentioned, as Danielle just read. In the King James Version, the word meant libertines is what it says. The synagogue of the libertines, uh, short for liberty. But the word libertine is from the Latin, originally referred to a man who had been a slave. So just getting some context on these people that were opposing Stephen right now. That's where I'm going. The people that were opposing Stephen had been in Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right. So whoever these people were, Peter's message of Jesus Christ caused them great amnesty. They didn't like it. They didn't like it. The freedmen and tries them like the freedmen could not stand against the wisdom of the Spirit, as we just read. So with that being said, it, uh, it, but the ironic part is that the synagogue of the freedmen called themselves that. They called themselves the freedmen, that they were free. They may have been free from one type of slavery, but they were slaves nonetheless. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. The Jews to whom he was speaking had objected to the idea that they were slaves. They didn't know they were slaves. Kind of like when we share the gospel with people and sometimes they don't, their eyes are not open. Because we can't open their eyes, and we're going to get to that tonight about being bold when we share, planting seeds, but we can't open their eyes. 
the Holy Spirit has to through the words that we share. We are called to go and to share, but we can't open their eyes. These Jews, Peter was proclaiming the gospel, but their eyes weren't open. They didn't believe they were even slaves, so their sin had not been revealed to them. So, the Jews that objected, but Jesus right here showed them the path to true freedom. If we hold to my teachings, Jesus said, you are really my disciples. And I love that. That's a big if. If we hold to his teachings. If we hold to his teachings. Well, in order to hold to his teachings, and it was a huge, you know, a devotional that I had that I did at my, my prayer group uh, Tuesday and sent out was, if we hold to his teachings, if we love, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And I challenged everyone that would read upon that, that listened to me, that we will not love someone that we don't know. And we're not going to ever know someone that we don't spend time with. Just think about the people in your life who you hold dearest. You love them. Well, why do you love them? So just think about that relation and, and think about Jesus. Put Jesus there. So, but it says, if you hold to my teachings, you are my disciples. Not maybe, probably. You are my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So despite the freedom's loving name, the synagogue of the freedmen were in desperate bondage to sin. In their slavery, they pr plotted to lie and murder, and they rejected the truth that would have set them free. Is that not just an ironic thing that here they are plotting against the truth that would set them free? Kind <laughs> of what we're seeing. But in this context, and I want you to know those people were what in this world thought they were free. Opposition you're going to come against, they think the world really thinks they're living the free life. They are free. They're not held down from anything, and that's what our world is saying. If you like it, do it. If you love it, okay. If you want to be this, be it. If you want to do this, do it. The world is saying freedom is there, but it's a lie. It's not. Freedom comes through Christ, and until we see the issues in our heart, our eyes can't be open to the glory that we can really experience. Through Christ. But in this, Stephen, and I love this because Stephen relates to every one of us out here. Every one of us out here, and you might say, no, not, not me. Stephen was just, and I think he was 29 years old during this time right now. Stephen was a young man. He was just your average Joe. But Stephen, he wasn't anyone special. He wasn't superhuman. He was a human being like you and me. The requirements for all of the deacons in Acts 6 were the same. And here is, here is a few of them that was in Acts 6, 3, just a few verses of good reputation, full of the Spirit and wisdom. We obviously know there's other things that come. If you look in Timothy and Titus, those considered were all qualified and able to do the task. And Stephen became the example for the type of Spirit-led follower that we should all be. So many of us will face various versions of this. This persecution where people will come against, these people lied against him. And we're going to see as we move further into this that he was even arrested. He was put before for, uh, leadership, government officials, and they began to question him kind of like we saw with Peter and John. Peter was completely, you know, lied on, claimed, claimed that he was blaspheming the Lord, that he was going against this, and he was teaching against the teachings of Moses and all of this stuff to rile up the Jews. Rile up the Pharisees. Rile up, get them all jacked up. In a sense, that's what, that wasn't the message he was sending, but they didn't like his message, so they're going to say, we're going to do what we can. Kind of like we've seen all through Scripture. You know, it's what they did to plot against Jesus. It's what they did to plot against Dan, Daniel. Um, we see it against Joseph when his brothers were the ones that plotted against him. Um, so many of us, like I said, will face various versions of this. You may not face it the way Stephen did, but you're going to face persecution. Somebody's going to turn their back to you. You know, or somebody's going to, going, to, going to turn an ear to you or not pay attention to what you're saying. Especially if we actually tell people that we're Christians and we seek to proclaim the gospel. In fact, and I, and I love this, you know, the author makes a bold statement. It says, it is impossible that any Christian could go a lifetime without facing some sort of opposition, however small, for proclaiming the name of Christ. Author challenges, and he references John 16, 
that it's impossible for us to go and not face some kind of persecution. Could be small, could be big, if we're standing up as a Christian for, for Christ. So, with that being said, what are some ways that you have witnessed opposition to the gospel? What are some ways that you may have faced personally, if you want to share that, or that you've witnessed other people? Could be in various ways, various things. Absolutely. Any others? And I think, you, you know, the more outspoken that we become for Christ, the more persecution we will face. I think the more that you share and you reflect that, the more you will face. But God shows grace, too, and I believe he separates us many people from you because of that. If you establish yourself as a Christian up front, I think it, it will keep you from suffering to a certain point because some people are going to recognize you as, you know, if they want to call you a Jesus freak or if they want to call you, you know, a radical or whatever they want to call you, however they view you, you've got no control over how they view you. You've got control over what you say and what you do. But they will separate themselves from you. They're, you know, you'll get some, you might get some just like this that will, don't care what, and they're going to tell you and do what they want to do. But for the most part, you know, I've seen that in my life. You know, I, um, having a conversation with some old friends at a reunion at a, at a football game one time, you know, and we hadn't seen each other for years, you know, and my life had radically changed, um, you know, to the point of, of I was a totally different person. Um, when I met them the second time, and the first thing that I referenced was that, that I was youth pastor at a church that I was now, you know, preaching and teaching and, and trying to serve the Lord in many different areas. And, you know, my family was growing and, and, and they just began to laugh. They said, there ain't no way that you're preaching. There's no way that you, you're doing that. Do you know what we did when we were in high school and when we were running around? That was how they came at me. So, you know, to me, that's a small form of persecution, you know, and that was, I was okay with it. And I said, hey, the Lord, if the Lord touches your heart, you'll do a whole lot of things that you didn't think you would do either. The Lord has forgiven me for a lot, for all the things that I had done when there was there. And I said, yeah, absolutely. Made a lot of mistakes. But it gave an opportunity to share, regardless if they accepted it or not. Now, these said, man, I'd love to come hear you preach one time then. They've never come through the doors yet, you know, because I have sent them many times whenever I was going to preach. I said, hey, this Sunday, come on out. I've, never, I've yet for one of them to come through the doors. But... It was an opportunity, you know, because I could have easily slid on back into old Bobby Joe, you know, when we was in high school instead of, but God's not going to let you do that. And the Holy Spirit's not going to let you do that. He's going to give you an opportunity. He's going to, you know, he's going to push and push and push you until you stand firm. So, but just, just one example of that, you know, you'll face opposition. You know, I faced things in, in school that said, oh, I don't know if you can do that now. Do you push back? You'll know when to push back and when not to. And I, and I prepared. I said, 
we need to be prepared because the world is going to push our hand at some point in time. You know, and we see that in other countries. We see other countries that are doing things that are life or death. Um, we haven't come to that yet. You know, or, or I haven't come to that. And I have that conversation. Could it be in America? Absolutely, maybe. But I'm not. It hadn't knocked on my door or in the community that I'm in yet. But I believe it's coming. Um, so prepare ourselves. Preparation. You know, and I love that the emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Stephen's ultimate weapon in dealing with this argument was what? It was the Holy Spirit. Use Stephen as an example. Stephen faced opposition. What did he do? You know, how did Stephen address it? He was a man of the Lord, full of grace and power. So let's direct ourselves when we face that opposition and look to Scripture to see how to handle it. You know, because if we don't, we'll handle it our way, and our way is probably not going to end good. So as you look right there on page 67, it talks about Stephen didn't merely win a debate with these guys. He defended the work of God in their midst in a way that was inarguable unexplainable apart from the Holy Spirit. He just knew what to say, when to say it. And I, I'm sure the closer you get to Christ, the more that you're in His Word, you have the answers when you need them. Because as we, as we lead in this, what two of the big main reasons or basic excuses from what uh, the commentary says right here that are fearful of evangelism. Evangelism is just a word of sharing the gospel outside, I believe. You know, something we think, well, I'm not an evangelist. We know the gospel and we're called to share it. So when we share it at our workplace or when we share it at our family table, I believe we become evangelists. We're evangelizing for the Lord. Uh, now, people do it in different ways and different techniques, but two basic excuses that people have uh, that most people who are fearful of evangelism claim are they're afraid that they are not smart enough. They are not smart enough. Someone will trip them up, and they feel unprepared enough for this. Well, I think those are two in that. The altar put it as one, but not being smart enough. Right? How do we educate ourselves if we don't feel smart enough? That's my question for us all, because we're not ever going to be smart enough. If we want to leave that, we're never going to be smart enough to answer every question. It's just it's not going to happen. So we don't need to put pressure on ourselves and prepare to answer every question. We're not going to be. We never feel prepared enough. How do we get prepared? You know, the only way we can is to spend time with Jesus in His Word. That's how we prepare ourselves. Same way that you would prepare your supper. You've got to spend time in preparing, which takes a lot of different avenues. Going to the grocery, starting the oven, you know. Same way opening up our Bible. Spending time with the Lord, intentional time, listening to His words through music. You know, I love the music aspect because it's Scripture put to tone, and man, we can remember songs like no other. A lot of it is Scripture put straight into music. Also, they put too much pressure on themselves to persuade someone to believe the gospel. And you know, and I think this one's hard. You know, I struggle. I struggle with this one. Uh, have struggled and continue to struggle, thinking that. And if I just say the right words, they're going to receive Christ and be saved, get baptized. Show that to the world. But I've got to trust the Holy Spirit is giving me the right words, but only He can save them. Only the Holy Spirit can open their eyes, reveal their sin, and that they need a Savior. I can tell them it. I can tell them I needed it, but I'm not them. Hence, that's why a parent can't save their kids. A pastor or a priest can't save a person, they have no power to do that. None. Are we to train them up? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. Scripture says, you know, it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training up. But we got to know Scripture to do it. So don't think you have to grow the fruit because you can't. You plant the seed. You plant the seed and then hopefully somebody comes along and waters it. If one of you plant a seed... Who knows that if Jason plants a seed in somebody at his workplace and then I run into him, we end up in a conversation and I water that thing. And then they go off to somebody else at the gas station and run into somebody and run into Todd and Todd throws a little bit of water on there too. You know, and then that's how it happens. We may not see the fruit grow in our lifetime or in that instance. But man, that is the hope that we have of planting those seeds and watering those things. 
Two, two, two things to do. First, we should always proclaim Christ with humility, patience, and long-suffering. And I love this. If we are rejected from sharing the gospel, somebody doesn't believe it, they don't want it, or they just say, no, thank you, however it be, it should be on the basis of the offense of the cross, not because we were jerks. And I kind of like that. Not because we tried to push it to them, force them into it, but because we proclaim the gospel and we let them receive it. So... Do it with humility, with patience, and it's a long process. Secondly, we should remember that the Holy Spirit is living within us and speaking through us as we seek to share the gospel. Our boldness is not wrapped up in our ability to wow people with our speech. Rather, our boldness is the willingness to share the gospel at all, to mention Christ's name outside of here or a group of Christians, to mention it otherwise when you see, you need to, because I know the Spirit brings it to your attention and says, man, this is the time. Take advantage of that. So, next question. What is the biggest fear you face in evangelism? And I don't, you know, I know that's a big way. We'll just say publicly identifying with Jesus. Put that on there. The church and the gospel. What's the biggest fear you face? And if you just want to repeat one that I said right there. Being shut down, argued with, all right. Fear of not knowing. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, that's been that's been one, you know, when you have people come to your house. You know, going door to door and you think, man, we don't answer because we don't know what they're going to ask. And that's the thing of being prepared to share and, and express your faith in a way that you feel confident to do because you don't have to know all the answers. And I, you know, because that was my biggest fear, not knowing. What if they ask me something and I have to say I don't know? Well, then they're thinking, do you really know your faith? You know, then they're going to make me feel like, well, maybe I don't. You know, the same way with Anthony's thing right there. What if we do get into an argument? Am I going to respond Christ-like because I'm prepared up to not respond if they get mad at me or if they throw me some crude remark? You know, am I prepared to humbly respond to them? Definitely. Great points. Point number two, God's people proclaim God's Word empowered by the Spirit's understanding. Got a few more verses right here. If somebody would like to dive in to them... If not, I'll get a little reading in. All right, I'll dive in there. Our ancestors had the tabernacle, the testimony in the wilderness. Just as he spoke, just as he who spoke to Moses commanded him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. Our ancestors in turn received it, and with Joshua brought it in when they depossessed the nations that God drove out before them until the days of David. He found favor in God's sight and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. It was Solomon, rather, who built him a house. But the Most High does not dwell in sanctuaries made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What sort of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or will what will be my resting place? Did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are always resisting the Holy Spirit as your ancestors did, you do also. And what Stephen is doing right here, Stephen went through and we went from chapter 6, verse 10, all the way here to chapter 7, verse 44. Stephen went through the whole Old Testament, really going all the way back to Abraham and he worked all the way through it as he proclaimed the path of the Old Testament which the Jews held to and believed. And said, we're sticking to Moses' law. He went through a whole thing. So he approached them with God's word. He proclaimed the scriptures to them. Because he was prepared up. He was prepared and Stephen knew. So Stephen's like, hey, no, here is where I'm going. These Old Testament scriptures point to Christ. You know, the New Testament 
is, is completely consumed with the idea that really knowing the Old Testament Scriptures leads to a belief in Christ and His words. Believing in Christ and receiving the Holy Spirit, He sends, helps us rightly read and interpret that. You have the Spirit that will interpret the Scriptures for you. But we've got to utilize it and get in these Scriptures. You know, I love Proverbs this week. Uh, Proverbs 19, which was yesterday's reading, uh, focused on receiving instruction. How do we receive instruction? Uh, verses 20 through 23 talked about that. You know, he trusted the Word of God to do the internal work of changing someone's heart. Stephen trusted him. He trusted him. He didn't, he didn't trust in himself. He trusted in those scriptures that he knew, and he knew that the Holy Spirit, that is the Word of God, and the Word of God is what changed our hearts, and it'll change theirs. How have you seen the Old Testament point to the coming of Christ? Can you recall any specific times to where you see the uh, Old Testament pointing to Christ? <laughs> hey. Now... I can recall that with him being with with God, him being together. It's wonderful because that's exactly who he's referencing right there. It's the first. It was one of the first ones I had down. Absolutely, right back from the beginning. As soon as sin entered the world, God said, "Here's a plan." God didn't, he wasn't surprised. He, it didn't catch him off guard. Here's the plan right from the beginning. Any others, any other Old Testament pointing to Christ? Yep. Absolutely, and Isaiah does a, does a ton. The suffering servant, I mean, almost depicting exactly what happened to Christ. Um, I think Isaiah 53 talks about uh, exactly about the birth and leading up to that. There is, there's a ton of Scripture in the New Testament references the Old a lot. So, but what P Stephen's doing here, he's giving the Holy Spirit all the credit. He's saying, you're resisting the same thing that interprets this, just like your ancestors did. He's saying, you're doing what your fathers did. I mean, he's trying to point it back to them and say, it's come. What they were learning and what was proclaimed in the Old Testament has now come to life. It's real. So instead of going, and I love this, this, this comment, instead of going to our Bible simply for a nugget of wisdom to get us through the day, we should open it ready to worship the God who meets us there. And I put down there, Lord, help me with this. Help me to not just open this casually just because I know I need to, just because I know I... I you know, it's, it's my set time, my intentional time. Let me come to worship. Point number three. Last point. God's people face persecution empowered by the Spirit's filling. God's people face persecution empowered by the Spirit's filling. Anybody want to read these verses right here? I think it's four, five, maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And after he made that comment, now, Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, made that sentence in 51, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are always resisting the Holy Spirit as your ancestors did. You do also. And as soon as he made that, they lost their minds, and they drug him out. And obviously, 
commit enraged and prepared to stone him Stephen full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and it's amazing what Stephen did during this time you know it's amazing almost exactly like who from what she read exactly like who it's exact words of Christ I mean Stephen proclaiming what he knew Christ had said you know to the point of Lord do not hold their sins against them Father, forgive them for they know not what they've done. Exactly what, what Christ. He stood in the midst of persecution of death exactly the way a Savior did. So, but being full of the Holy Spirit, Stephen was able to stand this persecution even with one of his last breath, you know, crying out to his Savior for their forgiveness. So, why do we find it difficult to pray for and forgive those who hurt us when we think and we look at what God's people and how they handled it why do we have such a hard time with it I talked to one today in, in school that was saying man we're working on forgiveness and we're getting there where they had been hurt tremendously why do we have such a hard time forgiving Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, it's that personalness that holds us not wanting to forgive because we think they have they have hurt us personally. So that forgiveness is is really hard to come by. You know, one could be, and, and this one really hit me, we aren't full of the Holy Spirit. If we're not able to forgive as those full of the Holy Spirit were able to do. Seems the easy way of interpreting that. Those full of the Holy Spirit easily forgave those that persecuted them to death. I mean, stoning them, and I can't even imagine being stoned and looking up at heaven. But man, I mean, what a scene Stephen saw when he did that. And this is really one of the depicted martyrs that we know details about and how this Christian responded. We don't have many of those in the Bible. We know the 12 disciples were all martyred except one, but we don't have their last words, and we don't have, I mean, we can look up, and we've got some documentation on that. Uh, but, man, when you look at the Scriptures, this is a depiction of a Christian being killed and how he responds. But because of the Holy Spirit, Stephen didn't renounce his faith or cave in under pressure. And we can do the same. We may not be stoned. We may not be drugged out in the streets and stoned. But we may be asked to, why don't you feel this way? Why don't we believe this way? Well, that's wrong for you to say this about this person or to not do this or to not accept this or to not go along with this. We may be asked to say, because Jesus tells us not to. God's Word tells me not to. As a Christian, I have to follow His commands because I love Jesus more than you. I mean, I tell that to my wife. I love Jesus more than you. We have to. I love Jesus more than I do my kids. And I said, you should love Jesus more than you love me because it makes me a better father because I do. It makes me a better husband because I do. And you think about what you would do for your wife and your kids or your husband. Think about what you do for them. We need to do so much more for Christ. We need to be prepared to do for Christ what we would do for our wife or our kids. Because He needs to be above them. It makes us better for them if it is. Christ didn't see His own persecution or ours as a negative. You know, when we think about that, that persecution, we look at it as a negative because just like Daniel said, the world would see it as weakness. Forgiveness is weakness. It's a weakness. Jesus didn't see persecution, suffering as a weakness at all. It wasn't. You know, he faced the cross with joy. He doesn't see it as a negative. And I love one scripture that is in the Beatitudes, that one verse that I want to share from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, right from the beginning, blessed are you 
when others revile you and others persecute you and utter all kinds of evil stuff against you on my account. If you're being a Christian and they tell you, hey, well, you're a goody two-shoes or you're a Christian or yada, 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 then this is speaking and you are blessed because of it if you're refusing to do something because of Christ. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are blessed because of Christ because you're standing firm for him. The road, you know, and I love this last commentary and then we'll have our last question and we're, and we're done. Jesus, God's son, faced persecution and, cri and trials. He's our best example. He's our best example to go to and look, how did he handle? He was argued with and he was put down and he was questioned tons. How did he respond? Those are great places in the New Testament to, to look and to see. You know, I always say if you're not, you know, if you haven't dove into the Scriptures and you haven't read it thoroughly, dive into the New Testament, just the Gospels, and look at how Jesus responded to so much stuff. It's a great way to respond to a trial that you're going through. If we are united with Him by faith through the Spirit, then we should expect to be treated as sons too. Like the Son Himself, we know we are God's children in part by virtue of our suffering on His behalf. What seems like a negative to our flesh is a blessing in God's eyes. The road to New Jerusalem is paved with trial, suffering, and persecution. And yet, it is not wasted. Our momentary afflictions are nothing compared to our eternity that awaits us. So, a lot of our trial, suffering, to me, some of it's discipline for us. It's disciplining us, preparing us for days ahead. You know, Hebrews 12 is a great section uh, in chapter, in verse 12, verses 3 through 11, talk about the discipline of God's sons. And some of that is just discipline for us that we need. It's for our benefit. It's growing us as Christians. So how have we seen trials serve as a blessing in our lives or in the lives of others? Last question, how have we seen trials serve as a blessing? A trial that you have had to go through, a suffering that you have endured, how has it become a blessing in your life or maybe in someone else's life? Something that you thought was unfair, wasn't right. Something that God caused you to go through or allowed you to go through. We can use the word allowed, though God controls everything. So I think he puts you in situations. He puts me in rough situations to grow me. Anyone got any, any specifics either in yours or someone else to where you've seen through suffering? A blessing has come. gonna make me share I got two that are just wearing me out one and, and I spoke on it before one you know from sin entering into my marriage because when we a man and I got married we weren't in a right mind with the Lord we were consumed with so much on the outside of what a wedding is and what marriage is and we 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 had we prepared more for the wedding than we did for the marriage I mean if that makes sense and we weren't so we didn't go into it prayed up, prepared up, you know, ready to fight the battles that we were facing. So sin entered our marriage. But through the power of the Holy Spirit and us drawing together, forgiveness was received. And man, our marriage is, to me, right now, is better than it's ever been. It's better than it's ever been simply because the Lord brought us to forgive. Situations in which the world would say, no, go choose another. But because of that, man, the strength that has grown from a time of suffering to allowing the Lord to make it a blessing. And it's only by His power because we got advice to, to do other things. But it wasn't advice from the Lord. Another is when the Lord took our ability to have kids that, that I desired so much and I was just, I was distraught. I mean, I was an emotional wreck when the Lord took that opportunity and made it clear that He was taking that opportunity and it needed to be taken. Though I, though I disagreed. But I look at the blessing that came from that because had that not happened, I don't even want to know what would have happened. I know what we wouldn't have had. I can tell you, I can look over and see that. But that's a time of suffering in my life to where I look back and I say, Lord, man, I just want to pull all harms off and say, take it. Jesus, take the wheel. 
quit letting me try to drive. And I know you've got testimonies that you can think about of where, man, God's pulled your hands off and you've let him drove and you've seen, man, he drives better than I do. So think about that. How, how awesome it is when we submit to Christ and when we get to know him more. That gets that spirit active. It causes us to want to share the joys that he gives us. And man, we're evangelizing the joy and love that we have inside of us out in a world that may look at us weird. They might say weird things because they don't recognize that joy. They can't understand the joy of peace and forgiveness and, and you know, don't forget, don't understand those things. So share that because, man, it'll get them thinking. Lastly, our, our mission for this week. Hopefully last week you were able to, to live generously and was able to do some things generous. You know, you were able to be more honest. You were able to be more reverent as you approached God. Uh, those were the things that we challenged ourselves with last week, uh, living more of that, that way. Um, this week, what are some ways you will take up your cross and follow Jesus? goes right along. If we believe and we love Christ, then we are going to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and we're going to follow him. We got to. We got to. We can't say we believe something that we never put to action. If so, I don't know if it's really a belief. So, hey, how will we deny ourselves? All right, because we are coming off the fast, so you may not deny yourself food anymore or whatever you've been denying yourself. How are the people in our group facing trials and persecution, and how can we as a group support and encourage one another? Whether it be a physical pain, whether it be an emotional pain, pains that we know. Maybe it's a, a, an exciting thing. You know, we have a group in, in, the, in the church getting ready to go through a wedding. How can we pray and support and help that? Because they're going to need prayer and help and support. I know. I'm just thinking outside the box. How can we help us, you all? So who do you need to forgive and pray for so that they can hear the gospel and believe in Jesus? And that's a big one. If there is anyone that you need to forgive, if you don't even know if you've forgiven them and you think you have but you don't know, man, turn that loose because you're the only, we're the only ones that suffer from unforgiveness. That person's not. So who do you need to forgive that you could say, Christ led me to forgive you? Here's the gospel right there because they may never think you'll forgive them. I don't know. Maybe nobody. Maybe you know somebody. I mean, I've got a person at work that I'm going to be praying specifically that away so that they will come to forgiveness. I've got family members that need to come to forgiveness that, you know, and once they do, man, the freedom that comes with that. Questions, comments, concerns? Other than with Noah having to be almost drug out back here. Pray for that. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we come to you, and I, and I, and I praise you. Lord, I praise you for, for your your work in all of our lives. Dear Lord, how you take something bad and turn it to good. How the world may prepare something for evil and you turn it into something glorious. Dear Lord, may you continue to open our eyes to that. May we continue to seek to know you more, to, to know your desires and your wants, your needs. Dear Lord, may we learn more about you so that we may go share more about you. And when others are suffering, may we be that tool that you have placed right there to love on them, to encourage them, to be Jesus to them. Dear Lord, because through the power of the Holy Spirit, it is what is working in us. It is what is, can control every word we say, and we've got to trust that it's saying the right words. And we've got to love you enough to trust you and know that, hey, you're going to use us. Dear Lord, I pray for each one here and the opportunities I know you're going to put before them this week. Dear Lord, let them be bold. Let them be, be humble as they approach situations and let their words be your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Any specific prayers upon your heart tonight that you want to pray specifically?